All right, thank you. So this is a buff session, so this is really more about you than it is about us, and everybody can ask questions and talk any about questions? any topics that we want. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, what we've done, we find that, that in a buff session, it's usually best to kick things off with some discussion and uh, stuff that we've been working on, and that tends to loosen people's tongues. So we did prepare a few slides to get things going. Uh, with that in mind, uh, our first topic is uh, the Power 9 processor. We're very happy to, to have that having been announced over the last year that we've now got the Power 9 out there in the field. And uh, this, is, uh, this was uh, launched last uh, December and there are continued different systems being rolled out this year in various different configurations. Uh, this picture here is of something called the AC922, uh, and uh, it's a fully loaded system that's got, uh, or is, it, or is this this one? Yeah, this is this one. Uh, it's got, uh, you can see the, the two cores there, and then you've got uh, six uh, GPU units uh, lined up there as well, and this is a water-cooled system board, so this is, this is the big thing. Uh, you see these kind of configurations in the Summit supercomputer that we'll talk about. You, get, you line up a whole bunch of these things in racks and that's where you get the Summit supercomputer from. So, Talk a little bit about just what the targeted implementations look like for this. I'm going to put on my old man glasses to see some of this. but. Um, it's basically designed in, with two different sets of uh, ways of having the cores look. You can either have a very wide core and have half as many of them, and that's capable of doing uh, symmetric multi-threading uh, eight-way. Or you can have more cores, um, smaller cores, that will be uh, twice as many of those, and they're only capable of symmetric multi-threading in, in the four-way system. So that gives you the columns then. And then we have uh, both a scale out and scale up technology. So the scale out systems are going to be big rack systems for building out Linux uh, things. So the L models and LC models that, that we produce for that. And then the scale up is more of the, uh, the enterprise uh, version of these things. So you can sort of see how the quadrants line up. Uh, the scale out have uh, DDR memory, which no multi DDR4. And the scale up have really big. The big difference. Yeah. Okay. And there's a pretty picture of what one of the uh, chips looks like with the 24 cores on it. So if you if you count them, you can sort of see them down here. You get six in each, uh, or how, how's it set up? Yeah, six in each quadrant. Or one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, that's the. It adds up to 48 somewhere. <laughs> I can't remember how it's all set it's up. 24. It's yeah, 24. Tw 24, right. <laughs> yeah. No, 40, 96. I think we have 96 cores on that. Yes. <laughs> Maybe you do. <laughs> <laughs> I like to multiply by two as often as possible. Um, this, this is just an overlay diagram that shows a little bit more of, of, of how things are laid out on there. So you can see it a little bit better. Um, and from here on out, I'm going to let uh, uh, Sager talk to all the uh, the upcoming slides because he's uh, he knows a lot more about the speeds and feeds and the uh, the internal designs of the processor than I do. So, uh, anything you want to say on this chart? Uh, well, the, there's one thing. It's the L2 we shared between two cores. It's, it actually matters, <laughs> and that's a bit that's a bit of a problem, but not so much for for GCC. It's kernel problem. <laughs> they, they can handle it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let's get the next slide. Okay. So here's the fun picture of how things work on yes, the inside. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, this is a diagram of a single core. Uh, a single core is four pipelines. And there's two that act together because there's some things that you need need. Uh, well, they need to be together. Uh, the data flow is like 64-bit uh, for every pipe, so factors go on two of them. So, uh, uh, then you've got, uh, uh, after the execution unit, you've got the level one cache. Uh, uh, and uh, 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 let's see, uh, that, uh, that level one cache is just for load. So, Okay, let, let's, start, let's start at the top, it's easier. Okay, so you first get a 3D code, uh, uh, some extra bits stored, stored in the instruction cache for uh, easier handling. So then it goes to the instruction cache, 
they have branch protection, which is really big, but it looks really cool on this diagram. Uh, the instruction buffers, uh, so, so it can issue a whole bunch at the same time. Uh, uh, decode correct. There's still a lot of instructions that are that are correct to to multiple instructions. Like if you have a dot instruction, a record form instruction, it's usually correct to just the, the base instruction and a compare. Uh, uh, then you get this path. It goes to to all the all those four slices, and the brown slice, which isn't very interesting. Uh, Okay, so you have to, uh, the, uh, each slice has an uh, address genera generator that uh, it starts there. Uh, uh, address generator uh, is for all of the load to store instructions. So it can execute in parallel with any, any other instructions. So all your load to store is uh, mostly hidden. Uh, uh, it has a, it has a, si has a si simple integer unit. Yeah, that's that's the top that one. Yeah, uh, this is like two cycle, three cycle depends on instruction. Then you have the uh, the flow to point unit, which is pretty big, uh, and also does the com the co uh, more complex integer like the multiply. Uh, they have a, they have two uh, 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 taking take both slices. That's the per permute unit for factor per factor permute. And uh, uh, I'm not sure what QFX actually means. It's uh, quad and then probably integer? I think that's the quad word integer, yeah. The FX okay, is usually yeah, integer, yeah. yeah. So integer 128 support is in there. Right. The 128-bit uh, the integer instructions are atomic, while the factor instructions are not necessarily atomic for loads and stores. So, so that there's a special unit for it, wow. Uh, and the uh, uh, divider. Uh, the integer divider is really fast, so there's only one for two slices. It's bec uh, because if it's fast, it's big. So <laughs> and then there's uh, 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 those are the data store, actually. Uh, the address is already handled, so this is just the data for us. And it's all the rest of the code. Yeah. <laughs> And so the key issue is that, that you've got these these two slices ganged together for super slices to do some of the 128-bit yeah. stuff. So when things get dispatched, uh, some of these instructions will be broken out into two sub-instructions that get sent down the, the two pipes uh, ganged together. So. Uh, so there's essentially four of the same pipes for all the integer stuff. Yeah, go on. Uh, does the times eight? Sorry. Does the times eight at the top of the slide mean that there are eight instructions fetched? Okay. Uh, yeah. So the SMT four and SMT eight doesn't have anything to do with the number of. No, no, threads. no, no. no. Uh, SMT something means there's something threads at the same time. There's okay. so many threads running at the same time. Uh, it has, uh, but they all run on the same cores, and the cores, the core isn't uh, 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 divided up or anything. All the instructions run through the same core. Okay. So, so they just all the instructions are tagged like which thread they are in. You can only see their own registers. <laughs> Hopefully, <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Any other questions on the core design before we move on? So the uh, the dispatch. Uh, you, uh, you, uh, you, uh, you can get two instructions dispatched to to every slice at, at every cycle. Of course, it can only execute one, but you can dispatch two. Too. So, so most most uh, uh, most things are hidden, sort of. Right. All, all the all the bubbles you will get. Are yeah. Uh, are these? Uh, are these calls vulnerable to the, the Spectre and Meltdown type attacks, prediction-based attacks? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, we can we can talk about what we what we know at this point. I mean, yeah. yes, um, all modern power cores have problems with Spectre and Meltdown, uh, um, and even all all really old ones. Yeah, yes. it goes so. back quite a ways. Right, there's speculation uh, built into these machines in various ways. 
uh, branch speculation is, you know, uh, with the indirect branch prediction and things like that. And I guess the question is, are the fixes more expensive significantly slow it down? Um, it depends on what you, how you implement yeah. them and so forth. Um, so for, for Meltdown, there is uh, something that's pretty much fixed already for yeah, Power Yeah, Meltdown is without, fixed and the cost is like yeah. nothing. Yeah. Something. That's pretty the, much uh, There nothing. are fixes in the firmware, those are easy. There are fixes in the kernel, and those tend to be expensive. And those are for the Spectre-like things. So. Yeah, so, so like Spectre 2, for example, is all done in firmware for us. And so we yeah. don't have to do all of this, uh, I don't even remember what they call it anymore, the stuff that Intel did for Spectre 2, we don't have to do that. Uh, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Red Pauline, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the, the Red Pauline stuff, exactly. We don't, we don't have to do any of that. Uh, for Spectre Variant 1, everybody's got the same problem, which is it's basically not a compiler-soluble problem. It's something that people yeah. have to deal with in their code. And the kernel fixes are in there, as they are for everybody. Uh, at application level, that's still up to the individual application to deal with. So. Yep. Yeah. But luckily, most applications don't have to deal with that. So. Yeah. It's only a few. And as future versions of the Power9 processor come out, some of the, more and more of this stuff will be fixed in the hardware itself and won't require any firmware workarounds, and so that gets better over time. Right. Yeah, or have cheaper workarounds. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So. But uh, uh, overall, our position is pretty good on this stuff. There's some units I forgot. Uh, here in the middle, you've got the quad precision float unit, right? Uh, which is also the decimal float unit, which we had before. And there's the crypto unit, which handles AES, I think. And it handles uh, binary multiplication, binary field multiplication. So. Yep. Yep, that's about it, I think. OK. Any questions, boy? Yeah. The one is, is the IEEE 128. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, how is the performance of quad precision floating point arithmetics compared well, uh, to double precision arithmetics? Uh, uh, you know best, I think. It's, uh, the, the performance of IEEE 128 is like two or four times slower than. Yeah, the performance is. Uh, is this on? Yeah, it's just for, yeah, it's just for recording. So okay. Don't worry about that. Uh, up. The performance is better than using emulated either um, oh, IEEE 128 <laughs> or the long double support, but it is more slower than um, the double uh, functions because the double is highly optimized and it's like six clocks, and um, divide. For example, something like 100 clocks, 160 clocks. So it it is it is like the decimal where it's done bit at a time or a few bits at a time. So you know it's a, it's a matter of it's faster than than the other 128 bits solution. But if you want to, if you want speed, you want double. That's like uh, the. Uh, 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 the, the unit has everything in multiples of 12 cycles, so <laughs> it's not that fast, but it's actually faster than double-double for some things. Not for all things, but for some things it's already faster. So. Yeah. yeah, it's the usual trade-off. It's going to be more expensive to, use, to get more precision. Yeah. But it's still a pretty pretty good solution for, uh, it's, for that It's a lot faster than uh, software emulation. Oh, yeah. Orders <laughs> of magnitude faster yeah. than that, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, I just want to talk a little bit about the Summit supercomputer. This is built on the Power Nines, uh, and this was uh, this is data from June 18th when this was published. This was uh, it was the fastest supercomputer in the world when it came out. Um, it has a capability of 200 petaflops. At the time, it was also number five among supercomputers for energy energy efficiency as measured there in gigaflops per watt. Um, the previous system that was used at the same Oak Ridge National Laboratory was uh, one-fifth the capability of this new machine. So if we've got a 5x uh, benefit to the government laboratory for this. And uh, this, this machine is used primarily for civilian scientific research. There's also a, another system that was built for the government that is at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory that uh, is used more for military research and that sort of thing. Um, 
You can see the specifications here. Uh, the GPUs are the NVIDIA Volta GPUs. Uh, as I said, you can you know, get up to six of those per board uh, and then you know, multiply that by however many nodes. We've got 4,608 nodes, so that's, that's a whole lot of GPUs. Um, that the, the no each node is capable of 42 teraflops. Again, you multiply that by 4,608 to get that big 200 petaflop number. And uh, well, I'll just let you read the rest of the, the information up there. But it's uh, the peak power consumption is interesting. Uh, all by itself, it's 13 megawatts, so that's a lot of power. Uh, probably don't want to just put, put that one of those in your basement. So. And so the most important thing about Summit is they have pretty pictures of it. So. Yeah. <laughs> so there's one. Uh, picture of uh, some of the mechs and some of the pretty new doors that they put on these things and uh, another side view of it there that you can, you can Fitch, get. Fitch doesn't have the power that's supposed to be on top or the network or whatever it is? Yeah, it doesn't look like it's, it's hooked up. This is, this, is early, uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is early installation, I guess, because it doesn't actually hook up to anything. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> I'm not sure if the previous one uh, had the hookups or not. Let's see. Yeah, this one. This one's hooked up. Okay, you can see all the wiring up there at the top. It's yeah, but this one is powered down because it doesn't have all the green LEDs. Yeah, none of the pretty lights. Pretty. <laughs> <laughs> I, I should also say that the systems acceptance test on this thing is actually still ongoing. I mean, large, large portions of it have been completed, but they're continuing to test this thing in the lab and, and complete all the work on it. So. Okay, so. Uh, enough pretty pictures, I should talk a little bit about what we did in GCC 8 this year. And uh, we spent an abysmal amount of time working on IEEE 128 floating point support. Our, our goal was to have everything from GCC and glibc and libstandard C++ and everything else all put together and signed, sealed, delivered in time uh, to make RHEL 8 because we thought it would be nice to have a new distribution that would have the, the new function in it. Ultimately, we fell on our swords on that. We missed in both the libstandard C++ and the glibc. Bit. We just didn't have enough people and enough expertise to, to get it all completed. So this will be completed over the next year instead in GCC 9 and in uh, the next uh, round of glibc. Um, our glibc guys here in the, in the back are getting very close to, to being done with their piece of it. And uh, we're working with John Wakeley at, at Red Hat on, on the rest of the, uh, the libstandard C++ stuff, which just turned out to be a lot harder than we thought it was going to be. Uh, it turns out that it's really difficult in GCC to have two floating point types that are exactly the same size. That's, that's a problem. Uh, it doesn't quite figure out how to do ranking on these things, and, and keeping track of two of them at the same time is just, is just a royal pain. And, Getting all the symbols right is where we've just run into a lot of trouble. Um, so, but we're hoping to get that all sorted out here in the next couple of months. Um, what didn't I say? Yeah, I just want to thank John Wakeley again, as I said, for his assistance on that. Um, another thing that we introduced this year was uh, x86 Intrinsics emulation. We have some new header files that will allow you to take code that was designed for uh, x86 vector intrinsics and make it work with drop-in headers. So you can go ahead and use the stuff that you've got, you drop it in, and it will automatically translate things to use the uh, power intrinsics that, that correspond most uh, uh, closely to the uh, Intel intrinsics. This is not a final solution of any sort for this kind of work, right? You do this you do this as a, as a quick porting solution. It provides something that will allow your code to work right away. We don't guarantee that it's going to be the best performance in the world because there are differences enough between the two architectures that you're going to be better off in the long haul rewriting your code uh, to be targeted specifically for power. But for a lot of the lower level um, levels of the uh, Intel stuff, the older stuff, the SSE level uh, stuff, uh, it's going to be pretty good. Um, scalar stuff, not so good. You know, we have to be careful about the vector scalar stuff because they put it in one half of the register and we put it in the other half of the register. So yeah. you end up doing a lot of emulation, swapping things around in registers. That's a little bit costly. There's but a lot of code that only works with the x86 intrinsics that doesn't work without it. It's like a whole lot of code. Uh, so it's mostly for that, for that. It's meant for that. So it will just compile out of the box. There's no generic version of that code at all. 
So that's a big problem. The generic version would work better than the x86 version on x86 as well. So, but it doesn't exist. There's only the intrinsic whatever. So, so we emulate it to uh, to, uh, to PowerPC, VMX, VSX, whatever instructions, factory instructions. And and for for simple things that that actually works out fine. Yeah. Uh, for complex things, now you you want to do a real port. <laughs> And we're finding there's just a lot of demand for this lately, that the people that are wanting to port over and do proofs of concept to see whether they want to be on yeah. power in the first place, want to be, have a way to just quickly test their application in some way and, and see that it works. And so this is, this is going to help us out with some of that stuff. Now, unfortunately, the, the guy who did all of the work on this uh, just retired last year, so now we, we have to support the rest of us without him. He got everything done up through SSE2, and he gave us a... Uh, basically threw a bunch of stuff at us for SSE 3 that hasn't been completed or tested, but it's mostly there. So we think we'll be able to get up to the SSE 3, SSEE 3 level uh, pretty quickly and maybe, maybe still in GCC 9. Uh, we're not so enthused about the AVX stuff yet. We don't see a lot of demand for people wanting to port the AVX stuff. There isn't nearly as much code out there in AVX. And AVX doesn't translate to power nearly as well as SSE does. So you get into more problems with, well, even your initial port is going to, going to be so terrible that it may not be uh, awfully useful. But we'll, we'll have to sort of see how that goes over time. We're still looking to see whether and how much we're going to fund that in the future. But uh, this, is, this is good for a start, I think. Um, Aaron Saudi, uh, who was here last year, gave a talk on some of his uh, inline expansion of the string and memory functions for power. Uh, you're, you're pointing at... Um, yes. Sorry, oh. sir. Yes. You, you mentioned that uh, generic implementations would be better for this kind of stuff. Yeah. So how would you do... So can you really write this ve vector SIMD kind of code in generic sure, way? Sure. Using the vector? Support of GCC or? Yeah, there's a uh, notation in GCC to okay. vectors and stuff. Well, so Applications work. Yeah, and in a lot of cases uh, you can just. Sorry. Simple things like multiplication, addition, you can just write as multiplication and addition. Applications work out. All the, all the stuff that's doing really strange, machine specific operations, whatever, that's not what you want to do anyway. Uh, and it, it, it's mostly code that's written for like, I don't know, 10 years old Intels, right? Uh, this is not good code for what, what a machine anyway. So. A lot of times the compiler will generate very good code for you if you do it right. You know, if you, you don't even have to write the, write the code in vectors in the first place. You write right. code that's easily vectorizable. But in C, you have to be very careful about how you do that. You have to use restrict pointers and various uh, other sorts yeah. of tricks in order to make sure that the vectorizer uh, can make the assumptions that it needs to make to be able to do these sorts of things. Yeah. Yes? Yes, my uh, question was in the same direction. If the generic version is better, why don't you provide a set of headers that just writes the generic no, no, no. version uh, instead of... You have to write application code in, uh, in a generic way to have it better. Uh, you, you should, uh, uh, the only thing the headers do is provide uh, x86 and twin six, provide the implementation for the x86 and twin six. And by the way, uh, we actually we actually do what you're suggesting. What we were saying is the op it almost is. If you can use the operators, well, that's what he's saying. If you can yeah. use the basic intrinsic operators right. of the on the types, that that's right. better. And actually, both. The Intel headers, and I mean GCC and LLVM, are too often now using that for normal SSE, not even right. for this power conversion. So that's already being done. And yes, where it's possible, the headers for Power Power PC are using the basic operators. I mean, equi you know, right. equality, addition, multiplication for this as well. So every, I mean, again, even SSE is doing this for their implementation of these headers now. So where it's possible, as Seher was saying, the challenge is for all these permutes and some other specific, right. where there, there are real specific semantics that aren't expressed in the basic operators 
that that SSE does in there, and it's very specific to the way that the SSE registers everything are set up, and that that takes a lot of effort to emulate in right. power or ARM or anything else, and that's where it requires also, as, as they were both saying, this assumptions about which part or half or quarter of a register something goes in and one needs to do additional swapping so that and and shifting around of the where thing where values normally are loaded for power versus where pa values are normally loaded for x86 so that the code otherwise can just in using the SSC can just assume that the values are where they expect them to be that's where you get into these difficulties yeah. and yeah. for example uh, uh, like floating point instructions that handle not a number of things those those have pretty weird semantics on SSC normally so uh, and it's important to to implement that correctly or otherwise you get a lot of PRs in Boxilla so <laughs> So, I mean, on ARM in R64, we also try to use the as high level operators as we can right. when they match the instructions. But we have to be careful sometimes because sometimes the, the semantics are almost the same, but not yeah. quite. Right. Like, not for example, quite, sign, yes. sign addition overflows undefined and is undefined in C on the plus operator, but on some vector add instructions, they actually have well defined wrapping behavior, and you want to preserve that. Right. Sometimes. We have, have more slides. Ah, have you sorry. looked into uh, providing suggestions or hints or warnings for the user to write that code to be able to optimize it? Um, oh, if you, if you try, it. To try to use this header, it says, no, 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 you shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually true. <laughs> it gives you a big warning the first time you, choose, you use these header files and says, you better know what you're doing because there are going to be performance implications and things like that. And yeah. this is, but beyond that, Well, to write better code. That so I mean, you, you can't really do that as a, at a warning level unless you're going to do something in like the vectorization dumps or something like that, because it's very specific to the vectorizer or something like that. And I think, you know, I think I heard that David Malcolm is looking into, you know, more information in the vector dumps. So that's right. that's one way that that can be handled. Um, the other thing is to teach people what to do with documentation, and so part of our big struggle is we don't have enough people to do as much documenting as we'd like on some of this stuff. I've been working in my spare time for over a year on a vector intrinsics guide that I eventually hope to get published that will have some of that data in it that will say, you know, the first thing you should do is try to get your code to vectorize and here are the tricks for how you get your code to vectorize. If that doesn't work, then here's what you can do with intrinsics. If you really need to do, you can drop down into inline assembly and do things, you know. Give people all of their options and try to give them guidance about what the best way to do these things is. So, yeah, that's very much on my mind. I just don't have enough bandwidth to finish the stupid thing. So, so GCC handles fairly well, you know, the obvious vector things like add two vectors together, yeah. uh, multiply them together. What it doesn't have is, um, A, um, support for arbitrary size vectors. You have to write your code knowing what the vector size is. Well, on that's yeah. that, this arms problem, um, right? And the other one is things like reduction operators. Yes. Yeah, there's yes. no, there are no idioms in the GCC extensions yes, to do things like nice reduction have, in yeah. a sensible way. Right. I think if we could deal with both of those, so for example, you could you could declare in GCC a vector of length three. Yes. Uh, and have the compiler know what to do with it on each architecture. That would make it much more powerful and usable by end users. Yes, absolutely. I fully agree with you. Um, something in there triggered something that I forgot. I'll see if I bring it back. Okay. Not right now, but when it comes back, I'll, I'll say something. Some of these. Yeah, some of these things I I I think belong more in a static analyzer than they do in the compiler. Yeah. If you're really trying to guide the user to write better code. It kind of feels like the compiler is the wrong place to be doing that. There's some other things as well, like uh, you can download from IBM.com uh, 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 port from x86 advisor things and whatever. Which I've, I've never used them. I don't write applications, I'm sure. It's uh, uh, but supposedly it works pretty well, so it will just advise you what to do to make your code optimize better for power. And 
Yeah, yeah. The, the source code analyzer that was shipped with yeah. the, the yeah. system yeah. development kit, code. yeah, is out there for that sort of thing. Uh, reductions is what was triggered my mind. Yeah, that's one of the issues is that all the architectures are very different on what kind of reductions yeah. they support, and we have we have lots of problems with that. And I think that's one reason that that doesn't get done is because doing it generically in a way that works for everybody is kind of a problem and well, just hasn't been done. And go ahead. I would also say uh, things like permutation, uh, particularly where you need to swap rows and columns and things like that, that you need to do at a more higher level that. And, and so forth. You know, permute tends to be a, an issue of how, how do you, you know, there are built-ins, but they're hard to use and, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, the other thing I see going forward where we're going to, you know, where we're having trouble is with um, vectorization, predication, lane masking, all this kind of stuff is also very different on the different architectures. You know, an ARM is doing some stuff with VLE that's, uh, changing a lot of what's going on in the vectorizer. I haven't had time to, to keep track of what's going on there, but I think that I've got to you know, learn more about that to see what's going on and how we can better share what's, what's happening there. That's all gotten uh, very different. I, I wish I had more time to monitor the vectorizer because I've seen just, just tons of new stuff going in there. It's like, I need to learn this, but I don't know what's going on. So. Um, so what else did we do? So the PowerPC SPE port um, has been in there sort of, sort of a mess for a long time. It's a big mess and, and Sega finally decided, okay, we're going to deprecate it and then we're going to uh, see if we can find another owner for it. So he separated it out and an owner was found, but we're still having problems with uh, the port is just not, not well maintained. It's not we. Yeah, okay, so this... By, by we, I mean GCC as a whole, not we as power, right? Uh, the, 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 the port is not supported uh, properly at this time. Uh, it needs to be, and yeah, it's never, you know, while it was part of the power back end, it would just cause us trouble all the time because nobody was paying attention to those pieces of it. So it got pushed out, and people complained and said, oh, you can't get rid of it. As well, okay, who's going to maintain it? And finally somebody said, well, I will, but didn't really. And so, so it's probably going to go away unless something happens with that. So if people in this room, if there are people in this room that care about PowerPC SPE, it's very likely to disappear in GCC 9 if something isn't done. So just be aware of that. Hi. Yeah, I'm the absent uh, maintainer, Gilsey. Oh. Um, I've, uh, uh, it, it's uh, been something that's been kind of a little bit down my priority queue, so uh, but I have now got uh, got my management to agree to uh, let me spend a, one day a week on it. So I think should be moving forward there now. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, getting stuff out to GCC test results on a regular basis, yeah. 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 We do thank you for taking over. I mean, we're, I, we're not trying to run you down or anything, but it's just like, well, it's, you know, things are happening. It's, you know, Jakob's getting impatient and all this sort of thing. So it's, uh, something has to happen or it's going to, you know, regardless, it's going to disappear. So. <laughs> okay, other than that, uh, we've spent some time on just general improvement of the Power 9 support, trying to optimize things a little bit better. What are we doing on time? Uh, okay, um, and quite a bit of bug fixing and that sort of thing uh, over the GCCA time period. So, questions on where we stand today on that? So, GCC 9 then coming up. Um, we still, as I said, IEEE 128 is top of the list. We got to finish the stupid thing. IEEE 128 needs to be done. Um, Aaron again is improving the inline expansion of his uh, memset, his Sternkamp his uh, Sternkamp stuff. Uh, he did quite a lot of that. It started in GCC7, added a bunch last year, 
and he's continuing to make really good strides on that stuff, seeing some really nice performance stuff. I've got a backup slide here that we can show later that shows all the, the performance that he's been able to get. He's got some really nice it's numbers. Really, it's really my, my polymerization stuff that it gives you a percent on benchmarks. So yeah, it's good. yeah, it's really, really good stuff. So. Um, we talked about the PowerPC support. We also deprecated a few other things. Um, paired single support is now deprecated. Xilinx splitting point support is now deprecated. Uh, we put in some weird feature called dash m altivec equals be a while ago, which allows you on a little endian machine to vectorize things in big endian form. Uh, it's, well, so I never liked it, no. <laughs> this, was a, this was sort of a necessary thing for some internal IBM library products that are shipped on AIX. And so uh, in case that stuff ever came over to Linux, we were, you know, going to support this stuff, but it's sort of bit rotted over the years. We don't really care about it. We're the reason we deleted it out. is uh, because a lot of it didn't work. So yeah, it used to. Like I said, it started bit started bit rotting. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it just ran out. So uh, and again, we're continuing to work on more Power Nine exploitation and optimization. And we've got a future processor coming down the mill. We're not allowed to say what its name is for some reason, but you can probably, you know, have some idea what it might be called. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, we, we are starting to work on some of that. We've spent a lot of time over the last year working on uh, ISA design with the hardware engineers and trying to get uh, some things that will help us out a little bit. And hopefully at the next cauldron, we'll be able to talk about some of the stuff that we're working on there. Right now, the ISA isn't yet public, so we can't talk about any of the new stuff and, until that's done. Uh, no, Power 7 is not okay. deprecated. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Big Endian is going to stay as well. Uh, L version 1 is going to stay. Everything is going to stay. 32 bit is going to stay for a foreseeable future. Oh, so this should stop supporting it. Well, so yeah. you have to be careful. Yeah, so the path forward for Linux is little Endian only, so little Power Endian 7 doesn't have a home. Bit, yeah. Right. Yeah. So for Linux, power, pa, pa, you know, going forward, that isn't going to be there. For the AIX operating system, Power 7 will continue to be supported for quite a long time. Yeah. So. And Power 7, there's probably not going to be very many optimizations for Power 7 anymore. But yeah. yeah. Considering we very, don't have that much time to do optimizations for yeah. Power 8 and Power 9, right? So, uh, yes, David. Yeah, but just to, to clarify that, that statement about ABI, I mean, in terms of Little Endian, it's mainly that the Little Indian ABI specifies Power 8 as being the base ISA. So it's not that there is anything inherently wrong with Power 7 even for Little Indian. It's just a matter that yeah. it's not given the instructions that the when we switched to Little Indian that we defined the ABI as supporting, that that won't run correctly on a Power 7 system. Yeah. Yeah. So that, but it's not deprecated in the sense of, oh, it, it says it's going away. It's simply a matter of, for little Indian Linux, right. PowerPC64 Linux, it requires the Power 8 processor. Yeah. <laughs> Let's put it like that. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions on that? Um, Sadly, uh, Tulio uh, is not here. Uh, he was supposed to be here for, for representing glibc, uh, but he had uh, some surgery on his sinuses last week, and his doctor didn't clear him to, to travel, so uh, he's not able to be here. Uh, so we don't have somebody to really talk, uh, you know, from a team leader perspective, the glibc stuff, but we do have uh, Gabriel and uh, Rogerio here from the, the team if we have questions about glibc. Tulio did ask us to mention these, these things. Like, again, they spent a great deal of their time uh, uh, on the long double transition to IEEE 128-bit floating point that's continuing to, to get wrapped up here over the next few months. Uh, they spent a lot of time on Power9 optimizations of specific functions in libc and libm and libgcc. Um, and they also added support for the IEEE 128-bit floating point stuff in the libdfp stuff. So. Uh, that's all that I personally have to say about glibc, but if you guys have questions about glibc, this would be a good time to take those and let our experts in the room uh, talk about that. Just, a, just a, uh, an explanation. The support for uh, 128 floating points in libdfp has not been added. It's uh, on the roadmap. Okay.
OK, so no real questions about DLibc. Then that's really all that I had to talk about to kick things off. Um, this is. This is just for, I'll leave that up there for people to look at, but Aaron sent along all this data about his inline progress and what yeah, happened, so I felt obligated to, to put this up here and let people see it. But uh, he's done a lot of work in the, the stuff for GCC 9 in particular. He started uh, generating VSX code for the uh, Sturkump and Sternkump uh, inline yeah. uh, for, for long lengths, uh, lengths greater than 16, and he's seeing even on just 32 byte lengths. He's getting a 50% faster uh, code yep. for that stuff than he saw on P8, 78% faster than, this, than the GPR code on P9. So it's a really, really big win for that. And because these things come up fairly often in certain benchmarks, then you start seeing, as Sager said, you see actual whole number percent differences. Uh, apparently, some, some C++ stuff uses string comp for uh, f uh, constructor, for copy constructors and, and things I like that. I yeah. Know, yeah. So anyway, it's, it, it's showing up as, as a big deal. Hi, Florian. So um, you mentioned that you use inline expansion of memmove and memsit. Yeah. And we have got an ongoing discussion on the glibc side whether um, the, the, the string functions can use unaligned loads and stores because they could be used on device memory and on some systems, right. some right. power systems, some ARM systems. Uh, when you hit device memory, you can't use unaligned memory access. That, so that my, is my, 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 yeah. my, yes. my question or my, my point here is, if you start inlining in GCC, then it's totally confusing to the yeah. programmer whether. The, the GCC code, uh, it makes sure not to cross a page not across a page boundary. So uh, it can be unaligned, but only within a page of memory, a 4K memory page. That's no, I, uh, no, it's that not. Yeah. No, we've actually turned off unaligned. I, I know, I know, but it's, yeah. it's the bigger problem. Uh, so there's a lot of hardware that can actually handle unaligned for the five mode. Yeah, but you're right that we still don't. On uh, Power 8 and Power 9, we still have problems with unaligned cache-inhibited memory yeah. accesses. Those don't work properly. Yeah. And so in the GCC, when GCC inlines these things, it has access to enough alignment information to know when it's safe to do that. And yeah. so it's only but going to do. Do yeah. Right. And so glibc has it. So this, this allows us to do some things that glibc can't. And so yeah, but I can show you some test cases that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Using memset and stuff on device memory uh, is not standard compliant to C standard. But of course, there's a lot of code that does it. So, <laughs> so, so I don't normally follow libc alpha, but if you if you're reporting stuff there to Tulio, you want to CC me directly. I, I'd I'd be happy to look at it, or if you want to do it on on the GCC list. Okay. Any issues that you've got with that stuff? Let's look at them and see what's what's going on. But yeah, I I don't normally follow libc alpha because I just don't have enough bandwidth to take one more mailing list. <laughs> So uh, other concerns about power in general? Anybody have anything they want to talk about? It's OK. You can go again, Florian. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the porting quirks that I've helped people with uh, is um, the variadic calling, a function call interface, where when you declare, uh, when, sorry, when you define a function as variadic, um, it assumes that the parameter safe area exists. And sorry, um, if you define a, a variative function in C, then the compiler emits code that assumes that the parameter safe area exists on the stack. But um, if you call the function through a function pointer that's non-variadic. Even a, that works on almost any architecture if you uh, only pass the non-variadic part. But uh, currently, GCC emits code which will clobber things in the caller stack frame because yeah. The, yeah. the parameter safe area doesn't actually exist on the stack. And so what does the language standard say about that, though? This, it's undefined, That's but undefined it's, I, can, I so. can say you. Uh, 
it's really hard to find these bugs, at least right. for, for a programmer who yeah. encounters it for the first time and usually... This is no change, though. I mean, this, this has been the ABI for decades, right? No, it yeah. can't. No, no, you got a new patent on it, so it can't be in the ABI for decades. <laughs> well, it has. The parameter save area has been, been yeah, required but for bar This particular forever. optimization to, to drop it in some cases, that seems to be the problem. My question is not, uh, I don't want to discourage you from doing that, but is there some way we can add something to Valgrind so that Valgrind can detect it based on Probably. Type information from debugging data or something like that. Rob, well, I don't know. <sighs> yeah. So, so uh, Bill, so Florian is actually right. So we did uh, add an optimization to the L32 ABI that a non-variadic function may omit the parameter safe area if it knows it isn't. Oh, I see. So we weren't. But for variadic, uh, you can't. Uh, you, you can't omit it, and that therefore the ABI is no longer compatible with the two cases. Now, it is undefined behavior to do that, and I think the place where you would detect it is, so really, if you have a function pointer that's non-variadic and you assign a function that is variadic to it, it's a type mismatch in the assignment. So that assignment should not go through. So you can have explicit casts. So the only way the assignment can, can, can go through is somebody cast it away, <laughs> which, is nearly all the time a bad thing anyway, <laughs> because... Right, but for this point, it's really hard, if the customer is, is used to doing that, it's really hard to find where it's happening, unless you have a tool like Alpine, which can do it for you. Well, yes, but, but in that case, those tools should look for function pointer casts that change the signature. But, but this well, is, but this is a and generic And the compiler should be able to do that without like you can, development. You can assign any function pointer to any function pointer, yeah. and it is Incorrect. Is is there no warning in the C front end for this? There is a warning. I, I don't know if it, um, it has a bunch of escape hatches, and, and I'm not sure if this is this is one of them. Yeah. So I mean, if you turn on all warnings, won't you find it? Uh, it, it the problem is that people write explicit casts for this in, in that code, and so you won't get a warning then. Yeah, in fact, GCC. Well, I mean, if people are doing are going to so much trouble to avoid error messages, <laughs> I don't feel sorry for them. But <laughs> yeah, so maybe the, the, we could add a new warning when we cast between a variadic and a non-variadic function pointer. Yeah, I mean, I think that should be in there in the first place. If it's not there, then, then that should be there. Yeah. There's a warning, but you can cast to avoid pointer first and then cast the second time. Yeah, but why are you doing this? <laughs> you're doing it because you saw an error message you didn't like. <laughs> you're doing it because you're really determined to be bad. <laughs> there really should be a warning like, your code looks complex. This is wrong. If you work in RTL.h, the compiler itself does this. Where it, it has all the different things for. If you look in RTL.h, it may not do the. It, it, it converts variadic pointers to different things for the number of arguments for each of the things in the expansion of um, all the instances, the gen instances, and so forth. Okay. Oh, oh, you you found all the bugs <laughs> and fixed them. Okay. We, did, we ended up changing our API. Yeah. Because of that. Oh. For the uh, inline expansion of these uh, string mm functions, uh, did you find more benefit when expanding things where the compiler knew the compile time length or the one where you expand the variable, yeah, the yeah, unknown yeah. length? Uh, there's a whole bunch that are only for constant length. Yeah, so if you look at GCC7, originally that was a lot of the stuff that was done was he started with yeah. the constant length problem because that's the easier problem. You see the constant length, you can say, oh, okay, we know what we can do. But you, you see that a lot of times it comes up where you've got, uh, got uh, things where it's much, it's unknown, and, uh, but you know that it's, you know, it turns out that even at 16 bytes, if it's unknown, you can still go ahead and, and, uh, and, and do it. So a loop, uh, 
we, we can do loop based stuff and so forth and, and find this stuff and so I guess which one has a bigger had the biggest impact do you have any oh. do you have any indication on that yeah yeah the biggest benefit comes from being able to vectorize this stuff though that's that's where that's where it really shows up is really starting to to improve things And particularly on Power 9, because there were some instructions added to, to handle uh, things that are, you know, doing vectorized uh, loads with length. So that once you, if you've got a number that isn't divisible by 16, you can still go ahead and, and do the tail with a, prop, with a, with a quick instruction that's going to get you the rest of the tail. And so that, that helps as well. Do you do this kind of vectorization with O2 as well? With O2? Or is it an O3 thing? Because usually... Oh. Right now, right now I think vectorization is O3 by default, right? Uh, auto-vectorization, yeah. Yeah. But these are not using auto-vectorization. Yeah, this is being done at all. This is O1, I think. Yeah. Okay. I, I'll have to ask Aaron for sure what he's doing, but I think... I think he might just be doing this at O1. He doesn't need any, any particular data flow analysis or anything, so why not, right? So I'm curious if the uh, expansion, sounds like the expansion happens pretty late during expansion and the string length pass. Yes, that's right. It's during the, the expansion of the string and mem functions during expand itself. Yeah. So uh, a lot of the non-constant string lengths are not available at that point, but they are available there, uh, can be determined uh, by the string length pass. So I'm wondering if you've looked into uh, optimizing or in introducing that optimization into the string length pass. Is that really a lot? How much is it? About what uh, percent? Uh, so I have no idea what the percentage uh, is. The, the string length pass determines the length dynamically, yes. so it should yeah. have. Oh, that's interesting. When when does the Sterling path uh, pass run? Where where is that in the in um, the? <laughs> I'm I, not sure exactly. Okay, I'm I'm not familiar with it, so I. I um, isn't isn't it a gimbal pass? It is a gimbal pass. Well, well, this is all done at expand time. So we're going to RTL. Right. So I'm wondering whether the information that the string length pass computes would be could be made available to you, at, you know, somehow uh, to be able to handle uh, uh, introduce the optimization at that point. Uh, I suppose it could be done by you know we could create a new built-in function with an extra yeah. parameter, for example, that you know would would do that. Uh, that, that's an interesting thought, and we should look into it. Uh, it. It doesn't sound like it would be hard to, to capture it and maintain it. But. The, the memcom using GPR instructions and BDN set T loop, we had to add that instruction. We didn't have that instruction yet. <laughs> it's a really strange instruction. Uh, it's it's like a page in an empty file. <laughs> it's one instruction. It's <coughs> but for some reason, it actually helps on even the newer CPUs. It's yeah. Uh, is any of these new strategies you are using on GCC be able to backport for glibc to improve the generic so. implementations? So you wanted you're asking whether we can use this in glibc and backport some of this stuff. Yeah. Um, so that's up to glibc maintainers, and uh, I, I, maybe these guys can talk more to that, but uh, it would have to get through the... Uh, uh, the current uh, string functions, at least most of them, I think Raja moved them to underline loads completely oh. because of the device memory issue. So we are sort of constrained by what we can do there because of the, the, the de facto ABI we have. Yeah, got it. Okay. Yes, that's all really unfortunate. They, they, the hardware guys always seem to think that it's very difficult to deal with unaligned and cache inhibited memory, so we, we keep beating on them, but yeah. that's a difficult problem. Well, it is difficult to deal with. Yeah, it is, absolutely. It's like impossible to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got five minutes now. Okay. 
Uh, we're, we don't really have any closing statements, so we can continue to take questions. No so. more slides? <laughs> we're done with slides, yeah. Uh, can, can we get the pictures back then? <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. We'll, we'll go back to pictures. Uh, there we go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> End on a positive note. Big supercomputer. We love it. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody.